stands for Chilhowee Area Ministries. And what it is is a group of people out of the Chilhowee Baptist Association in Blunt County, Tennessee. They uh, plan activities in the area that bring people to Christ. Well, I, I try to go on a mission trip every summer or every year and um, uh, have been to uh, Charm, Tennessee a few times. Went to Canada a few years ago and we had a partnership with uh, Potter's House up there. You can see God at work there and I just had a tug into, uh, to go to, to Canada this time to be a part of what God is doing at Bow Valley and, um, and in that area. I've always been involved with vacation Bible school type work. We really enjoy working with the kids and doing the crafts and, and so forth and getting to try to spread the gospel news to, to young children. And so it was just a time to, to do all those things and also to be with some of our Christian friends and fellowship with them and enjoy the love of the Lord has for us. I got a call from the Lord that he explained to me that in the past he sent people to start out the groundwork, sow the seed, and those people came back to tell us that they need more help. And so I pray about it, and I know that God wants me to do His work. So I went to Canada to help. Well, this was my fourth or fifth time to charm, so it wasn't a new experience for me. It was one that I knew would be fun. God knows I love to have fun, and so he gave, gave me the opportunity to, to go up to the Townsend area and have fun in the Great Smoky Mountains and be outdoors. I love that. And uh, working with the children, that's fun to do, and tell them Bible stories and work with them in the evenings doing games like uh, bingo and, and auction. It's just a lot of fun, so it, it's a good trip to go on if, if you're into having fun and being outdoors. I wasn't planning on going. I went the year before. Uh, Brady from Calvary was down here and was talking with us at our mission conference and said he'd like to have me back again. So I put it before the Lord and because I needed the financing to get there and the Lord provided that so I was able to make the trip. Um, my husband and I chose to go. We're new members to the church and we felt like it's always a good opportunity to get out of your comfort zone and we haven't had the opportunity to do that since we've been married. Um, so we felt like that was, that was a good thing for us to serve. Um, both of us have some medical issues that prevent us from maybe going to some of the far off places like South America. And, um, but we also felt like this would be a good opportunity to meet people in the church. I can even go back at other times that I'm not on a mission trip, visit the area and see what's going on, even make contact with some of the people that work in the community where I was so that I can encourage them in their faith and so that we can go ahead and continue to share Jesus in that same community. A short term mission trip has helped me in the past to stepping out from my comfort zone and know that the Lord always stay with me and guide me all the way. It's close by <laughs> and we can, we can prepare for what we're, we're doing and, and we can do a better job of carrying all the equipment and the tools and the crafts and so forth close by to, to make a more effective presentation. I know Joey talks often about uh, doing life together. Well, there's no more ultimate way to do life together than to be on a mission trip with uh, those brothers and sisters that uh, that you uh, you worship with, so it was just uh, that that's a big part of it. It just uh, you make relationships that uh, in doing that that are just awesome that will last um, a long time. It's always been a real pleasure and uh, lifting my spirit to be able to be used of Him this way. God calls us to do missions, and we don't all have the opportunity maybe to, to put everything down and, and leave our lives behind and serve you know, year after year like many missionaries do. And so this is our opportunity to, to do what God's called us to do. Going on a short-term mission trip allows me to focus on multiple ways to serve God. Here in Peachtree City, I get busy. I get busy with the things I want to do, I need to do, the things I have to do. 
and sometimes I don't take enough time to listen to God and find out what it is he wants me to do. Well, good morning. I don't have time to sing, so I'll just skip that part, okay? <laughs> Hope you guys are doing well. Hey, do uh, me a favor before we get cranking this morning. If you have a smartphone, would you take that out real quick? If you have it in your pocket or in a purse or something, take that out. And uh, I know it's very rare that a pastor would probably say, take your smartphones out, right? Um, but what I want you to do is, I want you to go to the app store, and I want you to download an app called Life on Mission. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in, in the message. But again, the, the app is called Life on Mission. When you get to the app store, it'll show up maybe as like a life conversation guide, I think is what it, is what it says. But if you'll go ahead and, and do that, like I said, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, again, let me say thanks uh, for being here, for letting me be here. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to share with you guys today. Uh, it's already been mentioned that I am Art's first cousin. We grew up more like, uh, maybe more like brothers than we did, uh, than we did like cousins. Uh, and as my older cousin or older brother, did I mention he's older than me? Um, <clears throat> it's like I said, it's a, it's a privilege to be here and to get to serve uh, with you all. Uh, we want to say thank you as well to your church. I think I speak for all the missionaries who are here, who've been involved in the weekend, and your church, your staff team, the host homes, everyone who's volunteered has done an incredible job in, in just serving us, and so we're grateful for that. I'm, I'm, some of you know, maybe some of you don't know all the details that go into um, the behind-the-scenes work to do something like this. Uh, my brother-in-law, my wife's husband, was a minister of music for a number of years, and um, they used to do um, dramas, things like that in their church, and um, he traveled one time to Indiana to where they were doing these outdoor passion plays. You know, they would tell the story of the last week of Jesus's life, and um, he went to one in particular one time, and he kind of got the behind-the-scenes tour, and you know, they try and make them as realistic as possible. So, for example, like they would have the Roman soldiers would use real swords. So they could clang them around and make noise, and it, like I said, it seems more realistic. But when the Garden of Gethsemane scene comes along and the Roman soldiers come to take Jesus out of the Garden of Gethsemane, um, one of the Roman soldiers accidentally stuck one of the real swords about an inch, an inch and a half into Jesus' thigh. So in the commotion of the scene, they get Jesus off to the side. No one really noticed, but when you got behind the scenes and they saw how deep the wound was, they called 911. They're sending him to the ER, and the director says, well, I'll just have to go out and tell everyone, you know, sorry, here's what happened. But one of the disciples said, you know what, we've done this so many years, I think I could finish the, the, the drama in Jesus' role. And you know what he did great. The crucifixion scene was flawless. The resurrection scene was perfect. They get to the ascension scene, and like I said, they want to make it realistic. So underneath Jesus' robe, he's hooked up to a harness, kind of an invisible wire goes up, and it's connected up here. And then on the backside behind the stage, they've got sandbags. And so what they would do at the appropriate moment, whenever Jesus has finished his, his speech, they drop the sandbags in the back, and Jesus literally up in the air, out of their, out of their sight, right? So Jesus gets to the end of his, uh, of his talking. He says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And they, they drop the sandbags in the back, and he goes up in the air about three feet. But they forgot that this Jesus was about 25 pounds heavier than the other Jesus. So he goes up about three feet, and he comes right back down to the ground. And in a moment of acting brilliance, he says, and another thing. So all of a sudden in his head, he calculates, oh man, I'm heavier than the other guy. I need to jump. When well, the back, they realize, oh, he's heavier than the other guy. So they lump another sandbag on the top, right? So he comes around and he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He jumps, they drop the extra sandbag, shot him straight up in the air, hit his head on the crossbeam, knocked him out cold. His feet were dangling. <laughs> Jesus didn't make it all the way to heaven, right? Two Jesuses in the same emergency room in the same town in the same night. Is that great? So I hope nothing like that happens, uh, happens today. Um, my, uh, my role in some ways, the reason that I'm here is I'm representing Columbus, Ohio. 10 years ago, 2004, my wife and I, a couple of other families moved to Columbus to plant a church. In some ways for me, uh, that was going, going home. Not only are Art and I from Ohio, but both of us are graduates of the Ohio State University. And we know it annoys everyone when we say the, right? 
That's why we do it. So for me, it was kind of a home going to plant a church. So I'm still the lead pastor. That's what I do full time there at LifePoint on the north side of town. A couple of years ago, the North American Mission Board, whose offices are right up here on the north side of Atlanta in Alpharetta, contacted me and said, hey, we would like for you to kind of serve in a role to be a liaison between church planters and church partners in Columbus. So for the last few years, I've done whatever I can do to help facilitate more church planting in, in Ohio. So the idea, the big idea of what we're, what we're doing is called the Send North America Strategy. The North American Mission Board has chosen 32 cities around the United States where lostness is greater than 90%. Columbus is one of those cities. The 15th largest city in America with a metro area of approximately 2 million people and less than 10% of the people who live in Columbus attend an evangelical church on any given Sunday. So part of why I am here is to talk to you about the partnership that your staff, your mission team, your church as a whole has begun to embrace with our city to facilitate planting, planting churches in Columbus. In particular, a small community called Johnstown. If you think about Columbus like a clock, it's about two o'clock Right on the edge, a new five-lane highway has just been built to this community of Johnstown. Uh, two new neighborhoods already have just been approved to be built in the last six weeks. This little community is all of a sudden exploding with people moving in there. The, base, the best way that I can explain it to you maybe is to say, what happened in Peachtree City about 25 years ago is happening today in this community of Johnstown. And so there's a planter there, a guy named Larry Hiles. He's a volunteer football coach at the high school. He's lived in the community for a number of years that you all have, have chosen to partner with there to plant a church in the community of Johnstown. And if you think about the big picture of the strategy, basically those 32 cities, they're throughout Canada, the West, uh, where we are in the Midwest and then, and then in the Northeast. The best way that I could say it to you is this. The majority of Southern Baptist churches and Southern Baptist resources are in the Southeast. And what we're trying to do is to get resources and people out of the SEC up into the Big Ten. Does that make sense? That's how I can explain it to you. So I'm here today to talk with you a little bit about maybe what that partnership, what that partnership looks like. Because see, what happens in our lives, there come moments as disciples of Jesus where he speaks to us and nudges us in the direction of following him that makes us a little bit uncomfortable, especially when we talk about this, this whole idea of missions. And it's not just that way for us. It was that way for Jesus and his disciples. They had these same kinds of of moments. And we're going to talk about one of those today in Mark chapter 5. If you have a copy of the scriptures and you want to turn over there, the narrative in Mark chapter 5 actually begins in Mark chapter 4. It begins in a little verse in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, when Jesus uh, says to his disciples, Hey guys, we are going to go to the other side. Now, sometimes we read the scriptures and there are little verses that we read, we just read right through them. This verse is a, it's a really big deal. Um, I'm going to throw a map of Palestine up here, maybe, and it'll help me explain a little bit, not because you don't understand uh, the geography of Israel, but maybe the picture will help you. You see on the left side of the map, um, starting in the bottom left-hand corner there, you see the area of Idumea, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. That is, that's the promised land. That's, that's Israel. And so in Joshua chapter 3, whenever the children of Israel move into uh, the promised land, that is where the 12 tribes of Israel settled. They're between the Mediterranean Sea, and then you see how the Jordan River runs north to south from the Sea of Galilee up on top all the way down to the Dead Sea, kind of on the bottom of the map. The 12 tribes of Israel settle there. Well, the people who were living in and around that land were referred to in Joshua chapter 3, verse 10, as the seven nations of Canaan. Well, what they did is when the 12 tribes of Israel occupy Palestine, they went just beyond to the east of the Jordan River, and they settled in the area referred to as Decapolis. You see it about midway up the map, just on the east side of the of the Jordan River there. It was also called the area uh, of the Gerasenes. Maybe you've read it that way. You've seen that uh, in the Gospels as well. So what happens over time is this mentality begins to develop that on this side, we are God's people. On this side, things are very, 
very different. On this side over here, on the 12 tribes of Israel side, on the Hebrew side, they were strict monotheists. They worshiped one God, Deuteronomy 6, 5, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, on the other side, they were polytheists. They worshiped many gods. And one of the gods that they worshiped over there, where the seven nations of Canaan were, uh, oddly enough, were pigs. Now, when, you, uh, when you're Rome and not all of the territory that you occupy speak the same language and literacy rates are really low, Rome communicated its values throughout the world at times through, through coins. And so I'll show you a picture of a couple of coins uh, up here that have been kind of uh, found through archaeological digs. You'll notice the one on the top on the back side of the coin. You notice the image there of the, of the pig or the wild boar. On the one there down in the bottom, you'll see the, the writing is there on top and underneath is the image of a pig. And so over in Decapolis, one of the gods they worshiped were pigs. Now, back over here on the 12 tribes of Israel side, how do they feel about pigs? I mean, they thought they were the most detestable of all animals, not ever to be part of the kosher Jewish diet at all. See, over on this side, on the 12 tribes of Israel side, they are strict rule followers, right? They have the law of God. On the other side, it was kind of an anything goes kind of world. Um, all types of sin ran rampant as they worship multiple, multiple gods. One of the reasons for that is that in Decapolis, there was stationed a Roman legion. It was about 6,000 soldiers that were stationed there in Decapolis, which brought tons and tons of commerce to the area, but it also brought tons and tons of sin and debauchery and brokenness over on, on that side. Now, one of the reasons they worship pigs is because the wild boar was the symbol of the of the Roman legion. So I want you to think about the two sides. Because over the period of about 1,000 or 1,200 years, what develops is, um, especially over here on the 12 tribes of Israel side, what develops is this teaching, this mindset about the people who are on the other side. So what develops is this mindset that over here on the 12 tribes of Israel side, we're good. And over here on the seven nations of Canaan side, they're evil. The whole idea, it just, it just grows and grows and grows. So it's, it's good and evil. It's right and wrong. It's normal and weird. It's uh, heavenly and creepy. It's Ohio State and Michigan. You see the pattern just works, right? So what happens over time is that the rabbis actually began to teach. They actually began to teach this idea that Satan, Lucifer, and all of his demons lived on the other side. And the reason I'm going into all this explanation to tell you all this is no self-respecting Jewish person would have ever caught themselves dead on the other side. Certainly not a rabbi like Jesus. So when Jesus says to his disciples, guys who maybe are, we don't really know their ages, maybe some of them are older teenagers, when Jesus says to them, we're going to the other side, I mean, they're like, Jesus, we can't go, we go over there, our parents will, no, we were busted, we're not allowed to go over. So when that little verse, we're going over to the other side, all of a sudden, this is a really, really big deal. And you know what happens at the end of Mark chapter four, if you've, ever read, if you've ever read the narrative, as they're on their way over to the other side, what happens? A storm hits. Jesus is asleep in the boat. The disciples say to Jesus, don't you care, Jesus, that we're gonna die? They wake him up. So they're scared to death. And that's a big deal because what were the disciples before they were disciples, a lot of them? Right, professional bass masters. So their job was fishing and boating on this lake. So if the storm was bad enough, they thought they were gonna die here they are in this place where they're scared to death. Well, you know the story. This is where Jesus wakes up from the boat and basically he looks out at the winds and the waves and he says the equivalent of, shh, be still. And when he does that, the storm totally dissipates. The sails fall limp. The sea goes slick like glass. And in verse 42, I think it's verse 42 of chapter four of Mark, it says this, that then the disciples feared exceedingly so I want you to think about that for just a minute. The disciples were scared to death they were gonna die. Jesus calms the storm, and then they're more afraid after Jesus calms the storm than they were before. So just to summarize, the disciples, it's the middle of the night, by the way, um, the disciples are, have been scared to death. 
Then they've been more than scared to death. It's rainy, foggy, stormy, as all that's just dissipated, so there's a thick fog set in. Jesus is taking them across the sea to a place that they honestly believe, they own the reality that Satan and all of his demons live there. And where does Jesus land the boat? Right in the middle of a cemetery. Look at Mark chapter five, and we'll start reading in verse one. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. When Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he, he, Jesus was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion for we are many. And he begged him earnestly, not to send them, them being these, being these unclean spirits, out of the country. Now, I know some of you have heard this story a number of times. Some of you may be here today, and you don't go to church very much, and you, maybe you've never heard this story. But if you can imagine Jesus and the disciples coming across the other side of the sea, Jesus lands them in the middle of the cemetery, right? This guy lives among the tombs. And out of the thick fog, there comes a crazy, screaming, naked man that throws himself down in front of Jesus, speaking with a, uh, with a voice that sounds like he's possessed with demonic spirits. And I just, I just know none of the disciples took one foot out of the boat. And they're looking at Jesus like, we <laughs> told you, Jesus, this was a bad idea. And you know, some of you know the narrative of what, what happens in this story. Here's a guy who lives in the cemetery because it's the only place that he could live. It's the only place people would allow him to live. These spirits have troubled him over his life. He has a problem trying to cut himself to get those spirits out and self-harm. And people had tried to, to, to subdue him, to shackle him, chain him, hold him. That's the only way, right, that we know the things that are in the passage. This guy was kind of like the, the local sideshow in some ways. Like if you had a friend come to visit town, you would say, hey, you got to go see this. You will never believe this guy. And the only way they held him at bay was to make him live in a cemetery. He comes and throws himself down in front of Jesus. And these spirits that have possessed him that are on the inside of him, they speak to Jesus because they understand Jesus' spiritual authority. And what's interesting in the conversation, in the back and forth between Jesus and the spirits that are possessing this man, that if you, if you know the narrative, the spirits say, listen, please don't send us out in the country, but they actually ask to be sent where? Into the pigs. There was a, a herd of swine there, about 2,000 2, pigs that the spirits actually asked to be sent in. Now, what did we say was one of the gods that they worshiped over here? Pigs. Isn't that interesting? And when Jesus asks the spirits, when he's speaking to the man, he's talking to those spirits, and he asks them what their name are, they say that their name is Legion. Now, what did we say was stationed in Decapolis? A Roman legion. Huh, isn't that interesting? All of a sudden, when you start connecting the dots in this story, you realize that there's a whole lot more going on here than just Jesus and the local screaming naked guy. See, what I see in this passage is that Jesus, for the sake of the disciples, is setting up this, this showdown between his authority and Rome's authority because only it had been about 100 years earlier that a, a Jewish man named Judas Maccabeus had led a revolt against Rome in Jerusalem. And when he led this revolt, the Romans sent in a Roman legion to come into Jerusalem. And when they quashed the revolt, they took Jewish leaders and forced them to eat pig's flesh in the temple, in their history, the Hebrews refer to this as the abomination. And Jesus sets up this showdown between his authority and Rome's authority. What's, an, what's amazing to me in the story is how the people, how the characters in the story respond to Jesus' authority. And it's 
we'll, for lack of a better way to say it, we'll call him Legion. Legion is the guy who embraces Jesus' authority. And Jesus sends the spirits. He lets them go out into those swine. And if you know the narrative, you know that all 2,000 of those pigs run off the hill and they drown themselves in that little, that little bay of water right there. And you've heard all the bad preacher jokes, right, about that. It was the original bay of pigs, Cracker Barrel's worst nightmare. It was a mass suicide it's for all you Arkansas fans, both of you uh, that are out there, right? And so what happens in this, in all the commotion of this is that somebody in Decapolis is there, has heard, has seen, and they go back to the leaders of the city and they come out to Jesus and they say, Jesus, you are incredible, powerful, never seen anything like you because now the local screaming naked guy is clothed and in his right mind. And so they say to Jesus, Jesus, you're amazing. Please leave. They're afraid. And so, as Jesus does, he, he obliges them because the people of Decapolis, this, this place that's inhabited by the seven nations of Canaan, they reject Jesus's authority. It's interesting, though, what happens whenever they get back in the boat. If you look down Mark chapter 5, verse 18, it says this, And as he, he, Jesus, was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he, Jesus, did not permit him, him, the legion guy, uh, but he said to him, go to your, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he, he, Jesus, has had mercy on you. See, what happens is this guy, Legion, all of a sudden, he wants to be the 13th disciple. So Jesus and all the guys, they're all getting into the boat there, right? And Legion just about to step right in the boat with him. And why wouldn't you? He, Jesus has radically changed his whole life, his whole orientation. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. What I want you to do is I want you to go to your family and to your friends and you tell them what great things that the Lord has done for you. Jesus and the disciples, they get back into the boat and they cross back over. Can you imagine the disciples rowing that boat through 2,000 dead floating pigs in that little bay thinking, what have we gotten ourselves into? And they go back to the other side. And the next day, when you look over at, uh, at Mark chapter six, um, I won't take the time uh, to read it all, but in Mark chapter six, here's what happens. They get back over there. Thousands of people are waiting on Jesus. They've been looking for him. And Jesus heals them. He teaches them. There's this huge crowd of people. And they get to the end of the day, and the disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, now that we're back over here in the promised land, the Hebrew land, um, Jesus, we've got to feed these people. They're hungry. And Jesus says, well, we're going to feed them. They're like, yeah, well, Jesus, just send them all home. And Jesus says, no, 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 you feed them. They say, Jesus, we can't feed all these people. All we've got are some fishes and some loaves. And Jesus says, you tell the people to sit down. He blesses them, or excuse me, blesses the food. They pass it out. It's the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 that maybe many of you have heard of before. And after the feeding of the 5,000, there's so much food left over that they gather it up in baskets. And how many baskets do they gather up? 12. And I'm sure the disciples, maybe they wouldn't say it out loud, but I'm sure the disciples, just a little bit of sarcasm in the back of their minds, they're like, see, Jesus, we're back on the 12 side. See, scholars like Scott McKnight and Ray Vanderlaan have pointed out that 12 was a really important number in Hebrew numerology. It kind of represented God's dream to reach the world. So when, he has, uh, when God starts the community of Israel, he has 12 tribes. And when Jesus chooses the disciples, he chooses 12 disciples, right? So 12 was a big number. So when they gather up 12 baskets left over, I got to think the disciples are thinking in the back of their mind, Jesus, see, we told you. Back over here on the 12 side, back where we belong, that whole little crazy going over to the other side, that's just one of those weird things Jesus does every now and then, but we're where we're supposed to be. Well, if you read on through Mark chapter 6 and heading into Mark chapter 7, there comes a moment. We don't know exactly how long it is, but at some point in those verses, Jesus says to his disciples, we are going back to the other side. And so Jesus and the disciples, they get into the boat, they head back across the Sea of Galilee, and when they land this time, things are very, very different. 
When Jesus gets into the to Decapolis, where the seven nations of Canaan live, when he gets over there, all of a sudden now thousands of people gather to hear him teach, and thousands of people bring uh, people who have various diseases, and Jesus heals them. So much so, it was so significant that one of the other gospel writers says about what happens there, that the people of Decapolis glorified the God of Israel. Incredible event. But you know what doesn't happen at the end of the first day of Jesus teaching back on the other side? The disciples don't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we've got to feed these people. Why not? Because the disciples don't care about the people on the other side. I mean, over here they said, Jesus, we've got to find a way to feed these people. They're hungry. Over here it's kind of like, eh. It doesn't happen at the end of the first day, and it doesn't happen at the end of the second day. And it seems as though, as we read the text, that at the end of the third day, Jesus is the one who brings up the reality. He's like, hey, guys, you think these people are hungry? We should feed them. And the disciples' response is almost like, Jesus, we can't feed all these people. There are thousands of people here because all we've got are some fishes and some loaves. Oh, we know what you can do with a few fishes and some loaves. We know. So Jesus says, have everybody sit down. And they do. Jesus blesses them. They pass out all the food. And this is the miraculous feeding of the 4,000. Two separate events in the Gospels. One time Jesus feeds the 5,000 over in Israel. One time Jesus feeds 4,000 people over on the other side. Now, whenever they're done feeding the people on the other side, there's food left over. It's part of the miracle. So they gather up all the baskets of food. And how many baskets do they gather up over here? Seven. Why seven? Seven. There were a little recession going on up in heaven. God's trying to cut back. We had too many leftovers, you know, over here with 12 baskets. So we're just going to cut back to seven over here? No. I think Jesus is making a very specific point to the disciples. Just as much as I love the 12 tribes of Israel, I also love the seven nations of Canaan. And just as much as I came to give my life as a ransom for the sins of the people who are the 12 tribes of Israel, I also came to give my life as a ransom for the people who are the seven nations of Canaan. So get this real clear, disciples. If you're gonna be one of my followers, you've got to care just as much about the people on the other side as you do about the people who are on your side. And I think if Jesus were sharing this text with us today, he would say to us, if you're gonna call yourself a Christian, if you're gonna be a disciple of mine, then you've got to care just as much about the people on the other side, the people who don't have me, the people that you disagree with, the people that you don't jive with their political views, the people that when you have conversations are abrasive and rub you the wrong way, you've got to care just as much about the people who are on the other side of your life as you do about the people that you know and that you agree with and that everything dovetails just perfectly with what you believe and how you believe it. See, I think God has given us this mandate to go to the other side. And listen, for some of you, and part of the reason that I'm here today is for you to consider taking a short-term mission trip, to go to the other side, to a place like Nicaragua, where lostness is so great, or crossing the northern border of the United States up into Canada, or maybe crossing, uh, going up to Tennessee to Charm, or certainly coming to Columbus, Ohio, coming to my city, a place that's on the other side of the Mason-Dixon line, where there are people who are not like you, who don't think like you, who don't believe what you believe, but who desperately need the gospel. My role in coming here today, I believe, from the Lord is to help you be a little bit uncomfortable about where you are. But let me also say that you don't have to go to Nicaragua or Canada or Columbus or Tennessee. You can begin to go to the other side with the people that you work with tomorrow morning 
with the people that you're in class with, be that at a local university or in high school, people that you're on a sports team uh, with, people who are your neighborhood. Think about the people with whom you work, live, and play. Who are the people that are on the other side? What I would suggest to you is that you and I begin to think about conversations instead of just thinking about conversion. Whenever we talk about talking to other people about Jesus, a lot of us, for a lot of us, it's just uncomfortable because we think it's our job to convert somebody else, right? I would say it's our job to converse with somebody else and it's God's job to convert. Conversion is not my job, however conversation is. You say, well, Dean, I have no idea how to do that. Remember when I told you at the beginning of the message to grab your, to grab your smartphone? If you were able to download the Life on Mission app, go ahead and open that up. And um, as you've got that open, you can, can just kind of swipe through with me. The, the, the organization that I mentioned earlier, the North American Mission Board, has put together this idea that they call uh, the three circles. And really the three circles is just a way to start uh, with someone, a gospel conversation. You can do this um, via the app on your phone, or you can do this on a napkin, kind of looks like, looks like this. We all kind of start in this, uh, in this circle that we'll call God's design, that God has created us in his image to know him and to be uh, in relationship with him, to live in relationship with him. But what happened beginning in the Garden of Eden that has spread to all of us is that sin has, uh, has changed God's design. Sin has left us in a spot that we're gonna call brokenness. All of us uh, are broken by sin, not just the people that, uh, that don't agree with you, um, not just the people who maybe aren't like you, but brokenness affects all of our lives. Um, I have uh, three children and the youngest of my three children, whenever, whenever she was, I guess she was probably she was probably about five years old or so, and she had a, she had a cold, and we were upstairs. Uh, for some reason, I can't remember why we were upstairs uh, near the bathroom that my wife and I use, and her nose was running a little bit, and I said to her, I said, Sylvie, you need to go blow your nose. So she walks into the bathroom up to my little counter there in my bathroom, and she grabs the washcloth that I was using to wash my face, and she just... <laughs> and blows her nose in my washcloth. And I said, Sylvie, honey, I use that washcloth to wash my face. You cannot blow your nose in my, in my washcloth. She says, don't worry, Dad, I do it all the time. <laughs> it's great, it's great, right? You know what Isaiah says in the Old Testament? That our righteousness is like filthy rags. So the best that you and I can do whenever we approach God is what? is brokenness. We're all across the board, all of us have been broken by sin. And so what happens is in our brokenness, we tend to try and medicate our brokenness. Sometimes we do that through controlled substances like alcohol or um, like drugs, or sometimes we medicate our brokenness, uh, not just through various addictions, but through things like anger. Sometimes we medicate our brokenness through things that comes out like worry or fear. Sometimes it comes out through things like racism, th uh, superiority, or sometimes just the opposite. It comes out through things like inferiority and always living for others' approval. Brokenness is rampant. It is not hard to see in our society. So what does that mean? That means all of us need to come to the third circle, and that's the gospel. The gospel is this idea that we are undeniably flawed. We're undeniably broken, but at the same time, we are unbelievably loved through the gospel of Christ, that God demonstrated his love for us, right? Romans 5, 8, and that while we were yet sinners, while we were flawed, while we were broken, Christ died for us, that we were unbelievably loved. So the gospel is what heals our brokenness, not just what saves us, but we as Christians, believers, disciples, we constantly need to go back to the gospel. If you struggle with, if you're here and you struggle with anger, how do you, how do you deal with all that anger? I believe the foundation of that is the gospel. 
is that when you see Jesus on the cross, when he was there, all of the wrath, the anger of God against sin fell on Jesus on the cross. So when you see Jesus taking the anger of God for you, how can you live in patterns of anger? Or maybe for you, it's fear. I'm not saying you'll never be afraid, but I'm talking about people who live with chronic fear. Listen, if God was willing to send his son to die for you, that's the gospel, right? Don't you think he's gonna take care of you and meet all of your needs? How can we, how can we live in fear and worry and anxiety? And I know that's not dealing with all the outworkings of, of that problem, but I do believe that that's the foundation of it. Let's say you struggle with superiority, feeling like you're better than others all the time. You know what the gospel says to you? All of us are undeniably flawed. How can you feel like you're superior to anybody to anybody else? Or what if it's inferiority that you struggle with and, and, and the need for other people's approval all the time to, to, to feel good about yourself? The gospel says that even though you're undeniably flawed, yes, you are unbelievably loved. Jesus came to die for you. That sets your value and your identity such that how can you live for somebody else's approval more than you would live for God's approval? You see, the reality is the gospel is the thing that heals all of our brokenness. And when that begins to happen, what happens in the gospel is that then we return to God's design and we can begin to become everything that God has designed for us. Now, um, that little, uh, just that little talk through, that, through the app, if you looked at it on your phone or through what you saw on the screen, it took about two minutes. Anybody can do that. I did it, I was sitting in a restaurant a couple of weeks ago, saw a guy, came over and sat down, we started having a conversation, talking about uh, church and some things. I took a napkin out, grabbed a pen, and in a minute and a half, just drew that little thing out, slid it across the table to him and said, hey, just take that home with you. No pressure. It's not, I don't have to convert him. Now, I asked him, I'm like, man, is that something you would like to do? And he said, you know what, I don't think I'm ready. I said, man, no problem. I'll pray for you, pray with you as God kind of speaks to you as you pray. If I can do anything for you, let me know. Not a conversion, but a conversation. It's planting a seed in somebody else's life. And I wanna say this to you again, you don't have to go to Nicaragua to do that. You don't have to go to Canada to do that. You can do that, you can do that tomorrow morning. Wherever you go, as God begins to speak to you. At the same time, I will say, as we think about next summer, and it's kind of a historic thing happening for us in our city next summer, for the first time, um, first time in history, the Southern Baptist Convention is holding its annual meeting in Columbus. And there are gonna be thousands of people next June that come to our city. Your church is coming during that time to help facilitate helping this church plant in Johnstown. And the reason that it's so critical for us that partners come is because God is bringing such a variety of people to our city. And one of the things that's unique about our town is that there's been this incredible investment over the last 20 to 25 years into the medical community in Columbus. So we have the James Cancer Center there, which is a hub of cancer research in the Midwest. We just finished the new Wexner Medical Center there on Ohio State's campus, and Ohio Health has, uh, has done, uh, built numbers and numbers of hospitals. And then because of that, there are these uh, kind of these different uh, capillaries, I'll use that word, that's kind of grown up in other kinds of medical facilities that are just drawing people and people, people in the Midwest to come to Columbus. One of those families, um, one of those families came to uh, our neighborhood, about five, it's been about five or six years ago. Now they moved into our neighborhood. And the reason they did is because they had a son who when he was four or five years old, Caden had neuroblastoma. Because of that, the doctors um, to save his life from the cancer, had to remove uh, both of Caden's eyes. And after moving in down the street from us, and there were a few families that, that lived in our neighborhood who began to reach out to them and minister to them, and they started coming to uh, our church, their family did, there came a moment uh, a couple years ago whenever, uh, whenever Caden reached that cross the line of faith moment. And he received Christ, gave his life, to Jesus. And so at our church, one of the things that we do whenever we do baptisms is that we do videos so that people can kind of, can kind of tell their story before, before they're baptized. And so I want you to watch this morning with me. I want you to see Caden's video the day he was baptized.
It all started when I was a little boy and I had cancer in my eyes. We had cancer treatment for two and a half years when they decided to take out my eyes to save my life. I asked my par my mom and dad if it, if, if it would be dark forever. And they said no, because if you accept Jesus into your heart, when you die, you'll go to heaven and you will see the brightest and the best colors and lights you'd ever seen. And that was my first journey with Jesus. My second journey is my real redemption at and salvation in Solomon's porch. And they taught us about Jesus. And at OSSB, I made new friends when, because the, the other blind schools in Michigan didn't they, they do very well. And now I'm in the middle of my third journey, which is making new friends at OSSB, Ohio State School for the Blind. You have to spread salvation on in pu uh, salvation and redemption on in public so other people can be saved and debt paid. You just you don't you don't you don't want to think only for yourself all the time. You have to think for others too. Second Corinthians in chapter five verse seven says, "We live by faith and not by sight." I. But I think every verse in the Bible is fit for everyone, including that one. But I think that one is just my favorite. It's my team. My name is Caden Hooks, and today I am going public. I wanted to show you his story this morning because he says it better than I can say it. You don't want to think of yourself only all the time but you have to think for others. What Caden is saying, I think is the same thing that I'm saying this morning. There comes a moment in all of our lives where we say to Jesus, I'm willing to go to the other side. For your sake, not for my sake, not for my comfort, but for your sake. And I would say to you all that there are hundreds and hundreds of families just like the Hooks that God is drawing and bringing to Central Ohio, and your work in Johnstown is gonna help meet the spiritual needs of families just like the hooks. If you are willing to take the step and say, God, I'm willing, I'm willing to go to the other side. Think about the difference. What was the difference between the first time Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee and no one wanted to hear him. They rejected him. They're like, yeah, Jesus, we're, wow, please leave. And the next time he crosses the Sea of Galilee and all of a sudden he feeds at least 4,000 men, not including women and children. What's the difference between those two? One guy. One guy that Jesus left on the other side who's never been to seminary, who's never been to a Sunday school class, who doesn't even have a Bible. He just went and told people his story. And I believe if you are willing that God will use your story to touch many, many, many people who are on the other side. Now you may be here today and as I shared the three circles this morning, you may say, you know what, Dean? That brokenness circle, that's me. I show up here on Sundays sometimes, or maybe you'd say, I don't ever come here. And everybody thinks that everything is good in my life, but really what I'm hiding is this broken reality. I don't have a personal relationship with Christ. Well, then maybe God has brought me here this morning to the other side for you. And the most important step that you could take this morning is to come to know Jesus through the gospel in a personal way. If that's you, I want to give you the opportunity to take that step this morning. So let's pray together. 